So I am really excited about this panel. Uh, and I want to welcome uh, Julie Ahmad and uh, Nadir Najib and uh, Zaha Hassan. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask each of them to tell you a little bit about themselves and their uh, cultural background. And then they're, both, they're going to be having a discussion with you about women in Islam. So I'll turn it over to the panel. Thank you. Uh, my name is Julie Ahmed, and I'm a high school and middle school social studies teacher at Oregon Islamic Academy. And I have uh, lived in Oregon for 40 some years now. My name is Nadir Naji. Um, my original home is in the Midwest. I live here and have lived in Portland, Oregon for about, as my eyes go back in my head and I think of my oldest child, about 37 years. And um, I'm an activist. I'm part of the, I don't know if it's still popular to say, but I'm part of the 99%. <laughs> and so uh, it's a pleasure, and thank you for having us. Hello, hi, I'm Zaha Hassan, and uh, I am an attorney. I was born in the States and grew up in California, but uh, also uh, grew up in Palestine off and on throughout my life. Uh, I just recently moved back to Portland. Um, in September, I was um, working on a UN project in uh, Palestine with um, the Palestinian Negotiations uh, Department. And I'm happy to be back in Portland. I missed it very much. <clears throat> My understanding is that human rights in Islam reflect some of the same basic human rights that are described in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. The Declaration of Independence, as we know, states that all people are created equal and that we are endowed by our Creator with the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Constitution establishes justice, ensures domestic tranquility, provides for our common defense, promotes our general welfare, and secures the blessings of liberty ourselves and to our next generation. Similarly, in Islam, humans are given basic rights by the same creator, such as the rights of life, equality, justice, defense, property, education, and family rights, among others. These rights are well documented in the two primary sources that Muslims refer to in their daily life, the Quran, which Muslims believe is the direct revelation of God, and the Sunnah, which is the example that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sets for other Muslims to follow. Uh, I will now provide some examples of some of the basic human rights that all Muslims and non-Muslims are guaranteed and state the sources of these rights. There is the right to have human rights in the first place. In the Quran, it states, Revere Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights and revere the wombs that bore you. There's the right to live. The Quran states, if anyone killed a person, it would be as if he killed all of humanity. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of all of humanity. There's the right of equality. In the Prophet's last sermon, he said, all mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also, a white has no superiority over a black, nor a black has any superiority over white, except by piety and good action. Uh, there are the rights of Muslims as well as non-Muslims that are stated in the Quran. The Quran states, O oh mankind, and this means not just for Muslims, but all Muslims. We created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other and not that you may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is he who is the most righteous of you. There's the right to be happy. In a hadith narrated by a Muslim, the Prophet said, Compassion and love for one another is like one single body. If a part of it suffers from pain, the whole body will suffer from in pain. Also, the Prophet said, 
Whoever wakes up in the morning feeling secure in his community, free from ailments and disease, and has enough provision for a single day, it is as if he owns the entire world. <clears throat> There's a, the right to worship freely. The Quran says, let there be no compulsion in religion. There's the right of justice. The Quran states, give full measure when you measure and weigh with an even balance. This is the best way and the best end result. There are the rights of the poor. In the Quran it says, and in their wealth, there was the right of the beggars and the unfortunate. And in a hadith of the prophet, he says, one is not a believer who satisfies himself while his neighbor is hungry. In another hadith, the prophet said, food for two is enough for three, and food for three is enough for four. And there are the rights to be safe. In the last uh, sermon of the prophet, he says, hurt no one so that no one may hurt you. Also, in the Quran, it says, men and women are protectors of one another. There are parents' rights. In the Quran, it says, be good to your parents, in travail upon travail, did your mother bury you, and in the years twain was your waiting. Hear the command, show gratitude to me and to your parents. There's a, the right to an education. In a hadith of the Prophet, he says, seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim, male and female. There are the rights of elders and children. In a hadith of the Prophet, he says, it is not considered among us Muslims who does not show mercy on our youngsters and respect our elders. And then, of course, there are women's rights that are well documented in the Quran and the Sunnah such as the right to own property, to keep and, uh, and earn her own income, to have financial support, to choose her spouse, to divorce, to inherit, and the right to have a respectful marriage. In the Quran it says, Allah created for you mates from among yourselves that you may dwell in tranquility with them, and he has put love and mercy between your hearts. Also in the Quran it says, live with them meaning women, on a footing of kindness and equity. In a hadith of the Prophet, he says, the best among you are the best <clears throat> that treat your wives. The best among you are those who are the best to your wives. And then finally, in his last sermon, the Prophet says, do treat your women well and be kind to them, for they are your partners and your committed helpers. These rights that I've just mentioned are by no means a comprehensive list of human rights in Islam, but a few brief examples of the many rights that God has provided for Muslims and non-Muslims. Although basic human rights are stated in the Quran and Hadith, human rights abuses against Muslims are widespread around the world, such as the events in Mali, where the mere <coughs> accusation of theft or adultery can lead to public amputations and stonings. In Syria, where the government is slaughtering its own people by the thousands. In Pakistan and Afghanistan, where girls put their lives on the line every day for pursuing an education. And in the US, where domestic violence against women is an ongoing problem. Human rights abuses that are inflicted on Muslims as well as non-Muslims are forbidden in Islam. Human rights abuses occur not because they're sanctioned by Islam, but because of ignorance, poverty, cultural influences, and power struggles in the, pol in the political and family systems where Muslims reside. It is the duty of every Muslim and non-Muslim to speak out against injustice and to demand that all of God's creation is treated with dignity and fairness. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from a Birmingham jail, he says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Similarly, in the Quran, it states, stand up firmly for Allah as witnesses to fair dealings, and not let the hatred of others to you make you swerve to wrong and depart from justice. Be <coughs> just. That is next to piety. Thank you. As we continue on, 
once again, I want to thank you very much for being open to listening. We get a lot of propaganda from media, and you need to see the faces that go along with the sometimes misconceptions of Islam, the woman in Islam. When you look at this panel, we're all from different occupations, different ways of life in regards to how we practice our Islam, but we are women in Islam. So to begin with, I'll say Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, which is in the name of God, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. I will say salam alaikum to my brothers and sisters and peace to the rest of you because this is what it is all about. The women in Islam have been given a very poor image through our media, through our misunderstandings, from our misconceptions. And I want you to stop. I'll take this for my two minutes that I was asked to give up. <laughs> so for my two minutes, I want you to take one minute, just one moment, and be honest. Be in your own head. When someone says, a Muslim woman, or a woman in Islam, what comes to mind? Be honest, in your own mind. A Muslim woman, or a woman in Islam. Now, I'm not going to quiz you or ask you to sign on a piece of paper what came to your mind, if anything, and you even addressed that, that question. But a lot of times, the concept of the Muslim woman through the media is one of oppression, one of neglect, one of abuse. When my colleague mentioned, which is most of my quotes, um, the rights that Islam provides, it's true. And with those quotes from the book, the Quran, that the woman in Islam adheres to, or strives to adhere to, did you hear anything about oppression? I'm going to give you a little backdrop. Over 1,400 years ago, and we use this as our reference because Muslims are aware of the Quran, as you are becoming aware. So when we go back to the history of this foundation for us as believers, this was a time pre-Jahaliyyah. Or actually, it was the Jahaliyyah, which means the wicked time, sound familiar, that women were buried alive, children, women, particularly girls, because it was a disgrace to have a girl. I don't know where the men thought the children were going to come from, but <laughs> this is what happened. This was practice. Women were not allowed education. Women were not allowed to have property. And if they were married to someone and that person died, their husband died, they had no compensation other than to be taken into the, the, the family, but still with no rights. The women were truly abused. Some of these practices continue in different forms, even here in these United States. But with the coming of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which means his peace and blessing, God be upon him always, the people were brought into, out of a terrible ignorance, that women, yes, are the foundation of the family. It defined that women have rights. That women have the right to keep their own name. Even here in America for years, 
when you married, you took your husband's name. So your name was his last name. We see, as women have progressed, they are able to, and they do, <coughs> have their name, and they might have a hyphen. But in Islam, through the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu peace and blessings be upon him, a woman was allowed to keep her name, to keep the property that she inherited, to give to the family if she chose to. And it is the responsibility of the male, the husband, to maintain, to maintain his wife. Not in a subservient condition, but as his garment or his partner in marriage. These are things you don't necessarily hear about Islam because the media is about giving the disparity, the exception to the rule. Our first priority, of course, is the family because that is the unit that society builds on. Why is it that we pay so much for child support or child uh, care? because that is a foundation piece that is so necessary. So this is stress with the woman in Islam, but does not keep her from going out for an education, from keeping her own name, from only her own property, or having the right to pursue her education, to have a meaningful work. Does this sound familiar? Yes. These are the things we all want. And even as late as 1920, the women in the United States had just gotten the right to vote. Because prior to that, we were considered, based on this culture, and I'm not saying one's bad or good, I'm just giving you facts. Uh, the main responsibility was to have children. And in some instances, we weren't believed to even have a soul. Around 1960, I think is the date, we were allowed to get credit cards. So we know what we've done with that since, since that permission is happened. Okay? <laughs> so a lot of the things that women are, in fact, able to struggle for in the states were rights given to the women. Muslim women over 1,400 years ago. So I know what your question is going to be. Well, what happened? I see this, I see that. When we talk to the, some women, they look, because when you see this, this is your, this is my choice. I recall, and I'll make this very short, a job that I went to get. And they asked me, uh, I had gone to the store so much they decided, well, look, we, we, why don't you try for this job? So I went, and the comment was, oh, um, is that a, going to be a, uh, a difficulty for you? And I said, no, unless it's a difficulty for you, and it shouldn't be. It doesn't keep me from answering phones, from addressing people, from writing notes, from doing the work that's required for this administrative assistant job. So, so that's not a problem. The problem was what? Our discrimination, our biases about the oppression of the hijab. So the Muslim woman has the right to choose so many things. And what you see on the media is not. What do you say? Everything shining isn't gold? Okay? Well, everything that depicts the Muslim women in general is negative. So what are some of the things that the woman can do? You know now? She has the right to go to school. She has the right for fair representation. She has the right to work. She has the right to keep her name. She has the right to own property and to maintain her property. And many times when the woman owned property in other situations, what happened? She married, she lost her property. It went to her husband. Over a period of time, Things have changed, even for the American woman. 
who is still struggling for fair wages, who now goes by her own name if she chooses. We'll talk about in the question part, I'll have one minute in the question part, about what happened. Why don't we see it or why do we feel this way? Ask yourself, why do I feel this way? Maybe you don't. Maybe you understand. But why do I think that the women are oppressed? Islam is an equalizer. It gives both the man and the woman honor, place, purpose, understanding, guidance, direction. And it allows us, because if as a threat, some people think that Muslims are a threat, with over one point, I don't know how many, six or seven billion Muslims, and the percentage that is here, there would be more disruption. We're peaceful people, and we have rights that need to be observed as we observe the rights and laws of the land. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Zaha Hassan, and I want to thank uh, everyone that came today. This is a really amazing turnout, and I really appreciate that you would take the time to, to come to something like this. And for the lawyers, you get daily credit, which is very nice. <laughs> um, but I also want to thank the organizers, um, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Amanda, and um, the Muslim Educational Trust, YHD, for doing this. Um, I have to come clean, though. When I was asked to speak on this topic, I was reluctant. And um, I called YHD and I said, why did you invite me <laughs> to speak about this? And I, you know, I'm not a religious scholar of Islam. I don't hold a PhD in Islamic studies. I don't have a PhD in women's studies or feminist thinking. So, and even my experience as a Muslim is probably not typical of other Muslims. I, uh, though, you know, I was uh, born into a Muslim family, and I was born in the U.S. and I was sent to Baptist Sunday school every Sunday. Uh, and when I graduated high school, I graduated from a Quaker school in Palestine. So I don't even have <laughs> like the experience of uh, a Muslim, a uh, typical Muslim, I would say. So when she said, no, no, Zaha, you are the one. You, you can do this. Uh, we want to hear about you and your personal experience and how you understand uh, this topic, Muslim women's dignity. And I said, okay, as long as that disclaimer is out there, this is just me <laughs> talking here, I'm willing to do this. So here I am. So I sat down and I thought, okay, Muslim women's dignity. Let's see, what am I going to say about that? And I quickly found that I was completely at a loss. I mean, Muslim women's dignity, is that like different than man, Muslim woman, <laughs> or man's dignity? Or is that different than non-Muslim's dignity? I mean... It was baffling to me. I was really perplexed by this topic. And then just the idea of what is dignity? I mean, I know it when I'm denied it. <laughs> you know, I know it when, when uh, I see it. But how do you define that and put it into words uh, that make sense for everyone? So I'm going to make this a little interactive at this point and ask you, if you will, humor me here, what do you think dignity is? Does anyone want to take just a gut reaction. What do you think that means, dignity? No one wants to even try. Wow. <laughs> We're thinking. I think it was that? Respect. I respect. Say respect. Anything else? What comes to mind when you hear dignity? Common courtesy. Common courtesy. So it's something like universal, really, right? So anything else? No? Okay. Well, let me tell you all. This was shocking to me because, you know, I, you know like any good lawyer would, uh, I had to research this. So what do I do? I pick up my iPhone and I ask Siri. <laughs> no, I don't have an iPhone. I would have asked Siri. No. <laughs> but I did consult like six different sources to see what is dignity? What does that mean? And six different, completely different definitions of what is dignity. And I'm going to read them out to you because I, I tried to synthesize them from these definitions what it is so that we can have a common understanding in which we can sort of talk about it today. The first definition was, it's a quality or state of being worthy, respected, or esteemed. So we got our respect there. Or it's 
concerned with how people feel, think, behave in relation to the worth or value of themselves and others, so it's sort of relational. Dignity, it, dignity is a person's right to be treated like a human being. Treated like a human being, I wasn't sure what that meant. But it's a right, so now it's a right. And the fourth one was refers to human rights. Okay, so human rights, we got that. Five, it's the right to make choices for oneself. And six, uh, dignity is when a person is treated with respect, again respect, and includes the right to privacy. So that's a very specific right there, human rights. So I had to take all these different ideas of what dignity are, because they are very different, and try to put them together. And I came up with three uh, threads, basically, um, that help me to understand dignity and, and to share it with you today. And that's, first, is it's a three-dimensional concept. It's not just how I feel about myself or how I'm being treated, but it's, it's um, also how I treat others, and, and it's how they treat me. So it's, it, it comes at you at three, level, three different uh, levels. It's not just how one person might feel. Um, and then also it's a universal concept, and we all have to have some agreement about what that means to be treated with dignity in order for it to be meaningful. And if you diminish someone else's dignity, somehow you've diminished your own. So there has to be some sort of common understanding, like we heard uh, from one of the members of the audience, that it has to be sort of common in nature. Um, and you know, the best way to understand this is, is the institution of slavery. It's not just the slave that uh, somehow has lost his dignity by being a slave and having his rights denied, but it's also the slave owner that somehow loses some part of, of his or her humanity by having uh, slaves. And then the third piece that's, that I took from these definitions was the human, human rights piece. But most prominent uh, among those is the right to personal liberty, which is the right to make choices for oneself and not have it dictated to you by others. And then the right to privacy, to have this personal space around you that others can't penetrate unless they've, they've gotten consent from you. So, okay, so how does Islam then jive with these, this understanding of dignity? Well, on the issue of universality, the Quran teaches, and I think Julie brought this up very well, the Quran teaches that there have been prophets for every nation. This means that we're all one human family, and that there are many paths to the divine, and that we're really on a journey together, though we might be from different places. And on dimension, uh, the three-dimensionality of dignity, the Quran teaches that um, God made many different tribes and nations so that we would know each other. So the very purpose of having difference and having people from different geographies and uh, cultural contexts and such is so that we will learn from each other. Um, and by doing so, we somehow become better human beings and we somehow better uh, humanity uh, as a whole. And then on the third piece, the human rights piece, the most prominent theme in the Qur'an, I would say, is the quest for justice. And I think Julie also brought that out as well, that, that we have to struggle every day um, to, to end oppression. And there's this idea that you know, there are people within society throughout human history that have been oppressed, and we need to be mindful of how we treat them and, and to, to strive to be... Uh, a just society. And I think in Christianity, from my, te from my experience going to church, <laughs> is that the common theme in Christianity seems to be redemption and forgiveness. But in Islam, it's justice and, and ending oppression and the, and the struggle that every human being has to go to, both in big ways and in small ways in their life, to end oppression. And the vulnerable people that the Quran identifies are women, children, the poor and orphan and mentally ill people. These are people that have been historically um, you know, denied their rights, denied their dignity. And so we need to be extra mindful of them. Now, it's not enough just to read the Quran and to understand the principles. We're instructed in the Quran to look at the, the prophet and what he said and what he did to, to be able to implement the principles that we learn about in the Quran in our own lives. And so I look to... Um, what was, the, what was the, the most important message that the prophet left uh, humankind with? It was in his last sermon, uh, right before he made his final pilgrimage. 
in which he talked about the fact that really humanity has, has conquered the big evil of our time. And what we have left is these small things. And what are the small things? The small things are how we relate to each other, how we deal with each other on a daily basis. These are the things that are going to make us successful as human beings or are going to be our failures. And the most important thing um, that he talked about was the relationship between men and women, and that men have rights, sure, but so do women. And, and how we treat each other um, and in the human family. And Julie also quoted this, but I think it's, it's so amazing to me that in the seventh century you could have someone saying this, somebody who was from the ruling family, who was socioeconomically considered upper class probably, and illiterate, saying that, and this is translated to English, you know, all humankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor does a non-Arab have any superiority over an Arab. White has no superiority over black, nor does a black have any superiority over white, except by piety and good action. I mean, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing for that time period when women were, were uh, chattel and, you know, People had slaves, and we had slaves, you know, even 200 years ago in this country. But to have that recognized at that time, I think, is was is pretty important, and for that to be his last message to humanity. <clears throat> so, what is this? How does this inform, you know, what we're talking about today, and, and the work that you do? And I think, you know, I hope that you're getting from this that um, that there really isn't any meaningful difference between the way Islam understands dignity and the way we understand dignity here. Um, it's really quite the same thing. Um, and then the other thing is, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to see the humanity in other people, you know, and to see the dignity in other people. It's not easy. Um, and, it's, and that's part of what we learn in Islam, is that's your biggest struggle. Your biggest struggle is how you're going to deal with other people every single day and how you're going to make sure you treat them uh, fairly. Um, so it, it takes a lot of work. You have to look behind the veil. You have to look behind the headscarf. You have to look behind the police uniform or the judge's robe or the briefcase that's in front of you. And you have to treat that person the same way you want to be treated. And it is, it is hard. It's not easy. But if you try and practice it every day, and try to put aside the generalizations that Nadira talked about, the stereotypes, um, you'll get there. And then just bearing in mind that these, th these principles are universal. They, they can't, there can never be an exception. You can't say these bundle of rights that we now understand as being part of human dignity that somehow, you know, it's okay to deny you or make an exception for you in this case because you're a little different, you might not understand it the same way, and so we need to make exceptions because the minute you do that, you, dev you devalue dignity for yourself. Just, that's, that's the way it works. So anyway, I'll leave it there, <laughs> and we'll have questions. And I think uh, Dr. Jamal, you're also going to be taking questions now too? Maybe you could, that would be a good idea. Maybe you could join the panel and we could have questions for about five or ten minutes. Will that work? And so you can direct your questions to a particular person or they can be general and, and we'll leave it to the folks up there to deflect them. Be careful, Dr. Jamal you have three strong women here. <laughs> I have, of course, one at home. <laughs> More than one. <laughs> No, no, not uh, white women. Don't <laughs> <laughs> I got I I guess I have an impression that there's a stronger mandate for young women or single women to be chaste um, than there is for men to be the same, is that true or not true? Dr. Jamal, that for you. I'm taking questions only on the two presentations as I understood. Yeah. I have to defer to my sisters because they were the presenters. Mm -hmm. Your, your question is though about chastity. Islam, chastity and, okay. and Islam. Is there a difference? So I think you're very qualified. <laughs> <laughs>
Under Islamic law and understanding, is there a difference? Well, or, or your experience in culture, uh, culturally. Oh, culturally, yeah, it's different, I think, okay. Uh, Islamically, uh, the men are supposed to be chased as well as women. There's no exception to that. That's right, that's uh, right. Regardless to what you may get from media or the things that we see in regards to making sure that the woman is chaste, the Quran, our founding, the book, the guidance for Muslims says that the men as well as the women should be chaste. Right. So often when we see it on the news, uh, when we see or hear someone where the woman has been stoned, we really want to know where the man is because right. he's been stoned too. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm mentioning that, but Quranically, there is no difference. The Quran tells us over again and again and again the believing woman and the believing man, one who strives to do what's right, who is God fearing, or at least God aware. The rules are the same. No one is superior than the other in regards to their roles. It does mention that men are the maintainers of women, mainly because of their physical strength and a lot of times they bring in the income, but that's changing too, isn't it? Okay, but in answer to your question, it's the same. The modesty, the purity is meant for men as well as women. Uh, is, is it? You're right. Actually, the Quran specifically, when it deals with punishments, it says the, the one who does this in the female gender and the man, the male gender. So it's a myth to think that uh, there's any preferential treatment or exemption in terms of demands of morality and chastity and punishment for crimes if proven with the qualifiers mentioned in the earlier periods. So the text of the Quran bears that. Yes. Um, let's see if I can phrase this correctly. I, I've struggled, and I think uh, many folks have struggled, at least uh, my friends, to understand how things have evolved here in modern times. I am the first to acknowledge that the Quran is an amazing document. It enshrined 1,400 years ago women's rights. Something, I mean, it's just stunning just to think about it. Um, but then we also see in Western media, uh, portrayals of uh, Muslim women, particularly in regard to, say, Afghanistan and Pakistan and the Taliban. And it's, I struggle to figure out how, how did we get there, and I'm interested in your thoughts as American Muslim women, how did um, things under the Taliban go so far astray, at least from my perspective, from the teachings of the Quran? You mentioned to that at the beginning of your lecture, I think, between culture and religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, go ahead. I, mean, I give you a preference. I, don't, I, can't, speak. <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak about Afghanistan you know, in uh, particular because I don't know much about the history there of Taliban. Um, but how things evolved, although I know that they were quite progressive before in terms of uh, the gender roles there, um, but I can say that it's, it, there is such a wide spectrum across the Middle East and across Muslim countries and Arab countries about how um, women practice their Islam and what the roles of women are. I mean, I'm thinking of just Palestine in particular, where you know, I've had experience growing up there and living there, um, that you, know, you, see, you see everything there. You see you can, you know, today you can find people that are wearing um, black and wearing the uh, face veil, or I mean, you wouldn't have seen that maybe 20 years ago. You, it would have been rare to see somebody wearing even a headscarf uh, back when I was growing up in high school there. And now you see, you see many more people wearing the hijab, and you see many more, but you also still find, you know, people that aren't, and. Um, I think there is a trend of people becoming more conservative in their um, practice of Islam across the Middle East. I think that's the case, but I don't know if you can really, you can put generalizations across one country or another as to why that's happening. Um, and in the same way, in the States, I feel like there is 
also a very wide spectrum spectrum of how Islam is practiced and how women feel you know they practice you know can practice their uh, Islam whether or not to cover uh, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I, it's difficult to make sort of broad sort of uh, sweeping generalizations about why this is happening in any uh, or across the board. I don't know in particular about Afghanistan. Um, Do you mind if I yeah. yeah. I want to mention uh, to you when you say that I'm understanding from your question you're talking about the abuse, correct? Yeah. And some of the things that you're seeing on the in, in the media in regards to the the girls trying to go to school and exactly. the, the, the okay those kinds of incidents. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to share this thought with you. Non-Muslims must realize the existence of a wide gap between Muslim beliefs and practices. A lot of time the cultural gets involved with it. It's like not all the actions of Muslims are Islamic. It's like labeling the status of women in the West or people in the West as being Jado, uh, Judy, Judy or Christian. So we can't lump it in a large base like you mentioned. So if I was to say, well, you know, the Muslims are doing this, there are those of us, as with any culture, with any place that you go, that will practice and understand differently. There is a foundation, the principles of Islam, and then there are the interpretations of people. There also are people with personal agendas. There's political agendas. There's oppression everywhere. There's women's suffrage everywhere. We're trying to get fair wages for the amount of work for women here. So in all communities, there are some discrepancies. What you see on the news, unfortunately, it's true in some instances. In other instances, you don't see the millions of people who are working peacefully to try to just make it through the day and to live their faith. So it's very difficult when I have a woman ask me who is a neighbor, not a Muslim, who asked me, oh my God, Nadira, how could someone do this to her daughter and throw acid on their face or, or beat them for trying to go to school? And I look at her, I said, guess what? That has nothing to do with Islam. The same way I would say, if someone would say, why did this man abuse his child? <coughs> Why did this man take a five-year-old and take him in the bunker? And keep him. What we have to understand, we cannot say that, okay, this is a Christian action. <coughs> this is what Christianity is based on. Or this is what Islamic um, doctrine is based on. And that's why we're here so that you understand that a lot of times things are lumped together, but just like you, just like me, we are still individuals. But we have a foundation piece. This is our Islam. And so when you see these different things, they'll say, uh, Islamic jihadist. They'll say a lot of different things. How are you to know? This is why this dialogue, this communication is so necessary so that you understand a lot of it is rhetoric and miscommunication, misconceptions about who we are. Or be radicalizing them when they do get into that path. 
I wanted to, uh, I was really appreciated your comments about the, how we cover for each other and Islam teaches us not to slander, not to backbite, or not to um, hurt one another. And even if somebody is doing something bad, try to cover him or try to prevent them from doing, going down that path. So I wanted to get your views on how we can help law enforcement de-radicalize. All right, first of all about covering I mentioned that in terms of, of the context of moral failing. And this is what is meant also by what uh, the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, said, Uman satara Muslim and satara of anyone who concealed the fault or shortcoming of his brother, and we can say, and or sister, of course, Allah will conceal his mistakes. But this has nothing to do, as I mentioned also in the presentation, I see somebody stealing government uh, public funds or somebody uh, the, uh, is in the process of committing an act of violence against innocent people, no, in that case, I'm obligated to try to stop it, advising the person if, if it doesn't work, even if it has, to, uh, it means that I have to report about my Muslim brother, I would do it because the Quran itself says, as you mentioned earlier, killing an innocent person, one is like killing the whole of humanity, that should take precedence. Uh, he's my brother, but principal before persons. Does that address it? But how to prevent it? That's the issue. Well, educate. We need not only educate the people of other faith communities, we need intra education as well. And that's why I mentioned the case of the, the, uh, the scholar in Yemen. His contribution is much greater than any other. Could, you know, contribution in terms of stopping things by force, by persuasion. Because you can stop things by force. But either the person, if he gets away, can come back, get at you, or that you get more people being recruited because there is that perception of oppression and injustice and so on. And it, it seems to be what is going on. You talk about Al-Qaeda, uh, heads, okay, the, uh, the heads or some heads are gone. But then all of a sudden, you get a more serious position or situation when they become autonomous. So there's not even a leadership that might direct them in whatever wrong even they're doing. It becomes totally loose type of situation. So the best thing really is to begin by education. And it is in that respect that we should focus more not on the entrapment, trying to come to someone that we think hates this or hate that, and try somehow to create a situation and we give you this. Uh, there is a line, I know, of course, between aborting uh, violence before it takes place or infiltration for legitimate purpose. I, I believe, and I'm not a lawyer or anything, you can teach me of this. And the, uh, between entrapment, getting to some immature young person and keep telling him, why oh, didn't you do this, you this, that, and then I supply you with this and then catch them. So the focus here is entrapment and prosecution. If we focus on reform and changing mind, then he got it permanent. And instead of having somebody permanently in prison, you get somebody permanently changed in the positive and reformative direction. Forgive me, I sometimes speak very frankly. <laughs> great, great. We have to be. That's right. Thank you. So, enter, you gave a very eloquent presentation on the on the uh, on jihad. You know, so that was very much appreciated. So, I want to I want to throw something out at you. That, uh, Mike, can introduce yourself? To just uh, I'm Mike Irwin. I'm the head of uh, TSA here for the state. So, I've all the airports and, and things like that. So, work for Department of Homeland Security. But you know, when you you hear this term all the, all the time, you just brought it up. Uh, Islamic jihadists. Universally, probably when you hear the media, it's probably a negative view, right? Which is probably not a good thing, based on you know kind of the description that you gave, or radical Islamic jihad. So, what do you think about those terms, and what would you, if if, if, if you're giving a presentation, not you, or somebody's going to present you, talking about terrorist activity, and when you talk about Islamic jihadists, that's really associated with the religion, which is probably not a good thing. What would you, what term would you use? To talk about someone who's been radicalized by Al Qaeda. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't you? use the term Islam by any means, any more than it would be totally inappropriate for me to say that Christian so uh, terrorists uh, of uh, the Timothy McVeigh or uh, the, during the Irish 
uh, conflict, a Catholic terrorist and Protestant terrorist or Christian terrorist for that matter. It is demeaning because I'm attributing to the faith itself rather than, as mentioned earlier uh, by my sisters here, that Islam is not Muslims. So you, you get the worst action of the worst Muslim <laughs> and put the word Islam on it. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a losing game, obviously. You, you, don't, you don't compare the worst person, you compare worst person, Muslim, and with the worst person, uh, Christian or Jew. Uh, or you talk about teaching of the Quran, teaching of the Bible in the positive sense. But we reverse things. We take the worst action of someone counting himself in one religion with the principle of another religion or democracy or whatever uh, it is. It is unfortunate, in fact, and my personal view on that is not to succumb to the abuse of the term that acquired a very negative type of meaning. And, and sometimes it's total contradiction. You know, like, uh, for example, uh, this is violent jihad. These people were planning to have violent jihad. If whatever you define violence as something that's unfair and unreasonable and inappropriate, in a whole lot of situations, uh, then that the, the, you talk about contradiction. You talk about actually inherent contradiction. That might uh, result if Muslims let it go and just criticize it, not say anything about it, or stop using jihad. Oh no, don't say jihad because the FBI will be after you. I prefer the provocative, truthful, educational approach, just like what I did in the MIT. Actually, in one commercial, I was giving lectures in India. I gave the idea to the producer, I'm not a producer, and he produced a 35 seconds point about jihad. And I gave him the idea. I am declaring jihad. That's 30 seconds. I am inviting my Muslim brother and sister all over the world to participate with me in jihad. And I am inviting all people of other faith community to join me in jihad. And then the scene changes with me holding, you know, some the microphone. Picture, yeah, picture. And there is a plant that is faded. <coughs> and I'm pouring the water to the plant. I say, this is saving the, this plant and the environment is a form of jihad. This was one of the successful ones because it had lots of well received, you know, because it shocks you at the beginning. Look at that terrorist. <laughs> declaring jihad and then get the scene. I think at least, even 30 seconds, a person would say, my goodness, uh, jihad means killing innocent people, you know, car bombs and all of that, and he's telling us the plants. So maybe that could be one approach. Anyway, that might be a specific, maybe peculiar to my provocative approach. But uh, what I'm saying that use the term jihad, but use it properly. I know sometimes you might put yourself in hot water. Remember, uh, shortly after 9-11, there was a bright student in Harvard University who was selected as valedictorian. And the title of his speech, My Jihad, and he meant my struggle in education. Uh, the, uh, in the very liberal, academically oriented, open-minded Harvard University, hell broke loose. <laughs> You're insulting the memory of those victims of 9-11. They didn't even bother. What do you mean by jihad? No questions. So uh, we use a term and try to correct it. Yeah, I was just more concerned about the vernacular that gets used in the media, and it almost seems like the vernacular is put out by people that don't have a really great understanding, right? So at, at some point, it seems uh, people like yourself have to enter into what should the vernacular be. Uh, because otherwise the vernacular would be made up as the easiest thing to associate with uh, an individual that says, I'm doing this um, because of uh, because I'm a Muslim and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this based on the crime. You know, people believe what they hear in short 30-second snippets. So the vernacular has to be something that is, that is created by somebody that actually has a depth of understanding. That's right, because right now the terminology has been stolen by the terrorists. So yeah, I don't. I didn't want to say hijacked, but that's uh, that was you, not me. Uh, 
but it's it's uh, because I, you know the media and, and us in Western culture who are ignorant um, of everything that we're here to learn about today, uh, but but who have historically been ignorant um, of, of the meaning of a word like jihad. Uh, so you hear you know a, a terrorist stand up and declare jihad and use those terms in that context, which is not you know, which does not uh, come from the Quran, which is not consistent with the true understanding of those words, uh, which, is, which is not Islamic. Uh, but then that's all we, that's all we uh, know or the media know. So it's, it's, they're repeating, they're, they're not in the initiators of those terms into the culture. That was initiated by the people who made the videotapes that are declaring this to be jihad, and now it's been co the terms have been co-opted, uh, and so I think it, we need, as Mike said, I think what he's asking is how do we help to be more intentional about, you know, turning that dialogue in a more productive direction because we're issuing press releases and we're going to court and so how do we have the tools to try to not fall into that trap that was you know that that was dictated to us by people who are terrorists uh, action follows yeah. proper diagnosis and i believe that uh, in the among some extremist called, called muslims when islam is against extremism as i mentioned earlier they perhaps uh, have limited knowledge, they're ignorant of the broadness of the meaning of jihad because, as I mentioned earlier, part of jihad also is struggling for the sake of God in the battlefield with all the qualification that goes with it. So people interpret things in their own way sure. and invoke it because it's a, no it's a noble prince, but actually in, in itself. So they invoke it to justify what they do. But I suspect there may be other cases where a term is invoked to line people behind you. And we find it in the history of Christianity as Islam, and in Judaism also, some of the statements made by some rabbis about Palestinians and so on, has been in, in the extreme, invoking the Torah also. Uh, for example, in the Crusades, the term of holy war actually was raised. What is so holy about it? I, I don't still not understand. <laughs> But it was a convenient, so sometimes there is the deliberate act of appease or appealing to the religious sentiments of people and say, oh, for, us, oh, for the sake of Christ and, you know, who those who go with the cross and, the, and their self and onward Christian soldier and so on. And there are also similar people on that side, but I'm not trying to overgeneralize and say all of it is agenda, but I say there is also misinterpretation and ignorance. Mm -hmm. So, and that you might find parallel across, actually. So, so the best way is to correct. OK, so you're giving a presentation. And you're, you're talking about, which we, a lot of us do in here, uh, if you're talking about Homeland Security and sort of thing, you're talking about uh, an act. Uh, not, for instance, Andrews Breivik in uh, Norway, the, it was, uh, we didn't refer to him as a, a Christian, a radical Christian a extremist or jihadist or anything like that. So, age, didn't, so did not get tied to that. Yeah. So if you were out in my position, you were given a presentation and you're talking about these particular acts, and there's, there's been a number of them by individuals, well, how would you refer to that? And because, because the American public, because of 9-11 being so emotional, because we're tied to it, because I've seen nothing but those terminologies in the news media associate that. So you're in my position, you're given a presentation, you're talking about some of those acts. How do you refer to that individual? I said the person who is uh, violent. Was, uh, violent extremist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be pretty creative. What, what I think is really challenging is that when you get an organization calling themselves with terms like right. jihad, Islamic jihad, I mean, how are you supposed to <laughs> right. issue a press release and not talk about that, you know, not bring up that? So, I mean, there, it's definitely calls for some creativity in how you deal with the subject. Um, but I, I, this, it just makes me recall uh, Fox News. Because Fox News also was trying to deal with this issue of, like, you know, how not to, or how to use our own terminology. We don't want to use the terminology of the, of the terrorist group. So they didn't want to use the term suicide bomber because that was giving the bomber some humanity to say he killed himself. So they decided they were going to call this person a homicide bomber. You know, <laughs> so they were they were creative. They figured out a word that kind of like took away the human side to the bomber and made it. You know, so it's 
the same way for, for you doing your work, you're going to have to be a little creative because a lot of times it is hard because the, the organizations are using you know, these terms to try to solicit sympathy by calling it Islamic or Islamic Jihad or you know, whatever it is. So it's not just what, what you're going to call it, it's they're, they're identifying themselves that way too and it, it is hard. Yeah. Um, I wonder whether the term also extremist might be used, uh, more acceptable but of course not attached to religion to it. Like right. when, when John Doe uh, committed a crime last night, the paper doesn't say a Christian terrorist or criminal that that uh, cr uh, crime is a crime regardless who commits it. Uh, so it just remove the name of the faith because that's what it, and I understand in the White House, I believe recently they uh, had instruction to stop using terms like Islamic terrorism or Islamic terrorism. Just don't drag the name of the religion because crime has no religion. Okay. Let's give him a hand. Uh, Amanda, with your permission, uh, uh, myself and Adrian and Dr. Jamal Barbi were walking here. We thought maybe an action item, you know, for the Islamic Society of North America and especially the scholars of the Fiqh Council of Islamic Jurisprudence of North America. Maybe it's time for for our great scholars to take. Uh, more uh, a step forward in terms of creating an action item or requesting maybe uh, President Obama, the Justice Department, to retain Muslim scholars as experts, you know, because you know the terminologies, you know the, the, the Islamic jurisprudence and the law. You would be better than the 12 dirty dozens that Islamophobia, the Fairness and Accuracy Report has said. So I think it would be a nice approach. My yeah. only comment on that, yeah. you don't need to spend a penny. I have given hundreds of these lectures for free. <laughs> no, no, to retain all, all, just as department experts. No, uh, no, not necessarily even that. Just to be ready to at least give a chance also for most Islam from Islamic perspective rather than self-proclaimed expert who could come from any source and background other than being a Muslim. Well, that's what we're doing here in Oregon, yeah. and so we you will we will <laughs> lead the way. And uh, and I, I do want you to know, and I, I think we've talked about this before, but uh, the White House has uh, you've seen if they've developed a strategic implementation plan uh, to engage with communities to stop violent extremism. Exactly what you've said, which is only through understanding education and engagement, because. These individuals who commit crimes, and it doesn't matter if they're Muslims. In fact, I would invite you all to attend our summit at the courthouse on Wednesday. Sue's like rolling her eyes. Nobody else can come. Um, <laughs> many of you are already signed up, but it's a call to action in looking at violence in our communities. And, and no religion owns this. Uh, uh, we're all a part of it. And no matter who it is that commits these crimes, uh, whether it is uh, somebody who has been labeled a Muslim terrorist or somebody who's a homegrown extremist or a white supremacist uh, or uh, when you look around the country at these school shootings, there's something in common, which is all of these people are disenfranchised. Um, they're all people who live in fear. Many of them are people who are isolated and are vulnerable because of their uh, struggles, either because of their backgrounds or their mental health issues uh, or something else. And so uh, that is that is. So you know, I don't even know that we can say extremists, but uh, but these are all folks who are vulnerable uh, to react in a way that's violent. And it you know, this is not something that belongs to any culture, race, religion, age, or gender. Um, but it's something that we all have to own. So um, I thank you so much for beginning this dialogue. I, I'm serving as one of two United States attorneys in the nation on the White House's task force to implement uh, the strategic implementation plan in developing uh, practices to go forward and be culturally competent and engage uh, with communities, and not just with Muslim communities, but with communities all across America in coming together to fight violence in our communities. So I, I thank you all for being partners with me, uh, and we'll move on to the next panel, but thanks again.